What's up, everyone? Kyle here. I am super excited to share that my audiobook version of Travel Tips is up now. You can find it on Audible, Libro.fm, and anywhere else that you get your podcast. Go check it out um, and, and buy a copy. It also has 30 minutes, uh, a little over 30 minutes of bonus commentary uh, that isn't in the actual book. So that's a little added bonus. Um, but go check it out. Uh, I appreciate all the support and I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone. This is Our Travel Experiences. I'm your host, Kyle Rasmussen. And today I have with me Geneva, who is the owner of Unwrap Your Map. Um, I'm super excited to have you here, Geneva. Like I was just saying, uh, your website looks amazing and your pictures are incredible. So I'm super excited to, to hear about your experiences. Thanks. I'm I'm super glad to be having this conversation with you. I've known you've uh, talked to a bunch of travelers over the years about all different kinds of stories, and it's always fun to to hear everyone's different insights and places they've been. And so I'm pumped to be here and share some time with you today. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, let, let's just kind of start. Uh, tell me a little bit about your business and how that that got started. Yeah. So it's kind of a funny story how that came about. I you know I had been traveling mostly for fun for myself for a little while, and it was, it was interesting how many people I was meeting along the way that kind of didn't really know what their options were as far as traveling long term. And mm-hmm. I'll be honest, for the first couple of years, I didn't, you know, first couple of months even, I didn't really know how to go for a long time either. But, um, I, you know, I kind of just started learning as I went how to stay abroad longer and find different visas and things. And so, um, you know, three months of travels kind of ended up turning into off and on seven plus years of being abroad. And I realized wow. along the way that there were a lot of people that wanted to know more about how I was doing that. And so the business um, was an idea that I had at, towards the beginning of the pandemic is when it really kind of became an option because obviously there were no jobs in the travel industry. Mm-hmm. So I decided to start my own business where I help other people find out how to achieve long-term travel goals abroad. And um, I kind of do that through, you know, travel coaching essentially and helping people find um, international work opportunities and visas that are open to them. And it's been kind of a fun journey getting started with something in the travel industry at a time when no one was traveling. Um, but the goal was just to to be ready for when, when things would start returning and when people were looking to get out and be abroad long-term again. So um, yeah, the, the business is all about helping people go abroad for extended periods of time. Um, and yeah, it's been kind of an adventure starting that during COVID. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. And, and what a time to, to start that too. Yeah. <laughs> What uh, can you speak to any successes that you've had in in coaching uh, clients? Well, it's kind of cool, actually. A few of them have kept me, you know, they keep me in their loop once they get out there and start doing their thing. And um, I've had one client who's just come back from her first like big backpacking trip. And she was in Europe uh, for a couple months and did the train pass and was traveling around. And I think she went to 17 countries in a couple of in the span of a couple months. Yeah. And that was that was exciting for me because that was how my travels started as well. And it was fun to see, you know, her take off on that adventure because she hadn't really done much international travel yet. And, you know, there's a lot of fear that kind of comes up before you take a trip like that. And you're like, I don't know how this is going to work. You know, how can I, how am I going (laughs) to accomplish this? And is this, is this crazy? The people around me think this is crazy, you know? So it was, it was fun to see her not out, not only like go out there and do it, but have an awesome time and come back and be like, wow, that was, that was incredible, you know? And um, I, I helped another kid find out about his options to teach English in Spain. And he's currently finishing up like a first year as a teacher in Spain and has decided to sign a contract for a second year and go back there, back out there and do it all over again. So it's it's really cool to see kind of how people, how people evolve and how their travel stories evolve as they go. So, yeah, I would say those are two of the more exciting ones because they're kind of happening in real time. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So we're... Where did your uh, love of travel kind of stem from? You know, it's funny. My dad always traveled a lot for work. And I remember as a kid, he would go off on these trips for sometimes two weeks at a time. And um, he was always traveling for business. So he was very much going for meetings and things that were prearranged. And, I, you know, as a kid, I didn't really know. I just I just knew that he was going these places and coming back. And he would always bring like a little something back with him from these trips, you know, a, a snack from this place or, a you know, a little piece of art or something, yeah. just something random to share with my brothers and I. And I always thought that was pretty fun. And, um, you know, I was interested in going abroad. But at one point when I was I think I was 13, we got the chance to go with him on a business trip to Switzerland. 
And so oh, that wow. was my first, it was like my first time outside the U.S. really. Um, it was just, it was just such an eye-opening experience. And I remember being like floored by the, the landscapes and the culture and the food and everything about it. And I mean, I was still, like, still a kid in many ways, but I remember thinking like, wow, if I can find a way to do this, like on my own and, you know, in, in a number of places, that would be awesome. But I think I just didn't really know how to make it happen. And so it wasn't really until after college that I had been saving up some money and I just decided to go out for a little bit and see what I could see what I could see with my budget. And it kind of, I think the real love for travel came about once I actually got out there and started going and I realized, you know, how much more there was to see and how much more I wanted to do. And it kind of, it's, it's weird how it grows like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like the more I travel, the, the longer my list gets of things I want to yeah, see. And, you definitely. Know. <laughs> exactly. What places uh, are on your list right now? Oh gosh, everywhere. Um, I got I got a trip planned to Everest Base Camp coming up. Awesome. Um, that is very cool. Yeah, that should be fun. And I'll I'll try to work in some other some other travel uh you, you know before and after that. Um because it's a long ways to get there. Yeah, um yeah. but I would say, you know, like other ones that are at the top of my list, Antarctica, uh Japan. Um I don't know, I'd I'd like to do more of Southeast Asia. It's been yeah. a while since I've been there. Um, in, in more of Africa, for sure. Very cool. Oh, Africa's Africa's exciting. I'm a big. Fan. I know. Let's look at your pictures. You got a lot of a lot of pictures from Africa. I do. That was a picture. That was a place where it was just easy to to just like get totally sucked into my photography. I mean, I'm an amateur, but it was really fun to to take photos there. Actually, that was probably one of my more favorite trips as far as like the pictures that I got out of it. Um, yeah. Where Where all did you go in Africa? Um, so I went, so I, I am very fortunate. I have a really good friend who I met when I was working in Cambodia and she's from Zimbabwe and she kind of organized and planned the whole trip for us. So it was about a month long trip where we went to South Africa, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and a quick day trip into Botswana where I learned a very <laughs> silly lesson in, in preparing in advance for my visas at the border. Um, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great trip overall, but I ended up dishing out, long story short, I ended up dishing out twice as much on visas um, when I went to Botswana for the day because I forgot to get a multi-entry visa um, for Zimbabwe. So we left for the day and upon return i had to buy a new visa to get back into zimbabwe because i hadn't purchased a multiple entry <laughs> which oh, i hadn't really thought about because <laughs> in my mind i was like we're just going for the day but yeah it's funny how that that stuff happens and quick lesson learned there but oh, yeah we did we did um you know four countries with that little day trip there so it was it was amazing wow that's awesome yeah africa is just such a unique place and i i feel like you know, I, I always like talking with someone who's who's been there because it's it's so different from what people usually, you know, travel to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I forget, too, you know, it's funny. I just listed those places, but I've also been to Morocco. But that's that's another thing is you kind of forget that, you know, northern Africa and southern Africa. I mean, it's a well, for one, it's a huge continent. So, yeah. you know, and the difference sometimes when you approach it, you know, like I came when I went to Morocco, I was coming from Europe. So I think in my mind, I wasn't even picturing that, you know, I wasn't even picturing adding that to the list because when I went to mm -hmm. Africa, I come more from the south. And so I almost was thinking like, oh, those are two different places. But of course, they're all <laughs> they're all in Africa. Yeah. It's just a, from very different perspectives that I came into each of those travels. Yeah. Well, and yeah. And like you said, I mean, very, very different places. Morocco is, is much different than, you yeah. know, South Africa or Zimbabwe. Yeah. 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 Much different uh, history and culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So how many uh, countries have you been to? To, on on paper, I've been to 49 countries. Um, I feel kind of cheeky about some of those because, <laughs> you know, they haven't all been for extended periods of time. And some of them have been mm -hmm. short trips, you know, two or three days maybe. Um, but technically, yes, 49 countries. And I'm hoping to do my 50th uh, in September. So, All right. What's going to be number 50? I'm looking at Jordan. I'm hoping to go to Jordan okay. in September, which I'm very excited about. I've been hoping to go for a couple of years. So um, looking forward to making that happen. Nice. That, that's awesome. I, that's definitely one that's at the top of my list as well. Uh, 
my uh, friends that I've traveled with uh, with FTLO um, the last couple trips, uh, we actually all booked uh, Jordan for next year. So oh, cool. Uh, yeah, we're That'll looking forward to that. Fun. Are you doing it like as part of a group tour or are you kind of independently organizing it? Yeah, we're doing it through FTLO. Uh, oh, again. nice. Nice. Yeah. That's so fun. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sorry. Go ahead. Oh, there, I was just thinking, you know, there's some trips that are easier to kind of like book as part of a, a packaged, you know, group experience. And for me as well, like Jordan is a place I've always wanted to go, but I think I've been a little, to be honest, I've been a little lazy to plan it myself. So <laughs> I'll be going with a group tour as well, actually. And I think it'll be, yeah, it'll be nice to have someone else take all the planning and coordination out of that for me. <laughs> yeah, nice. You know, that's, that's the thing that uh, I've kind of found recently. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I know I could go, could go do Jordan by myself and could go yeah. do all these other places, but it's like, I don't really, I don't really want to necessarily. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's more fun to have that group. And especially if you find it, you know, a good group of people, Yeah, uh, it makes that trip so much better. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I mean, I love, I love traveling and I've done a lot of solo travel, but honestly, sometimes you just, you're just tired of, of, I don't know, kind of doing the small talk over and over again with, with yeah. people in each location and then, you know, sharing rooms if you're staying in hostels and things like that. Like sometimes you just want to take all the guesswork out and just have like a prepackaged group of people that you can kind of hang out with and get comfortable with over the course of a couple of days. You know, you don't have to spend the time, you know, asking for recommendations for places and, um, you know, everything's kind of ready to go and you can just show up and have a good time. And then there's, there's a lot to be said for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so yeah, with your uh, 49 countries, uh, what would be maybe some of your, your favorites that you've been to? Yeah. Oh gosh. You know, that's like one of those common questions that I still feel like I don't have an answer for. And sometimes I change my answer <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> at different awesome. times of the year. If somebody asks me, I'll be like, Oh, this time it's this. And then another time it's that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, Overall, New Zealand and Australia have a really special place in terms of my travel story. And so I, I'm a big fan of um, New Zealand in particular. I just love the landscape there and the people. And I've and that's actually one of the few places I've been to multiple times. Like a lot of times I, I try not to go back somewhere that I've been before, you know, visiting somewhere new. I'll try and go somewhere new before I go back to a place a second time. But um, mm -hmm. New Zealand, somehow I've been there, I think, four times. Wow. Three, three or four times. Yeah. And yeah. You know, it was easier when I was living in in Southeast Asia because I could just kind of fly down there and it wasn't as far as coming from the States, for example. But um, yeah, I mean, it's not an expensive place. I mean, it's not an inexpensive place to travel. So um, you do kind of have to prepare for an advance, I feel like, and mentally prepare yourself mm -hmm. for the, the cost of that one. But it's just, it's such a beautiful location and I just love all the adventure and activity there is to do there. And it's it's just a place to kind of get totally lost in nature and just explore and cover a lot of ground in a small space. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty interesting for that. Have you been? Oh yeah. That's, you know, when people ask me that same question, um, it, it is a very difficult question to answer, but usually my answer is New Zealand as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, your... I studied abroad in Sydney and, and then I, I went to New Zealand for almost two weeks and just, absolutely fell in love i mean it's just so incredible like you said the landscape is just out of this world there's so much you can do there you can find anything that you want to do yeah you, people, you don't have to be around people there's lots of lots of places to go off on your own but yeah definitely amazing place yeah this is just such a beautiful country i i don't know i like some of the some of the specific memories I have, like in my travels, when I think about all of it together, you know, I, a lot of the memories that come to top of mind are, are specific hikes in New Zealand or, you know, day trips I took or just, just drives that I was on. And, you know, remember being totally like caught up in the scenery and it just, it holds so many like big, important <laughs> memories and locations. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, so I noticed that you uh, you always like to uh, skydive or bungee jump. Did you get to do that in New Zealand? I did. I did. I did my first. Um, I did my first bungee jump in New Zealand. Um, the Nevis bungee down outside of Queenstown, so on the South okay. Island. Um, and that one, I think, it was like 146 meters, which I don't even remember what that is in feet. But <laughs> um, yeah, it was a pretty. It was a pretty pretty long fall, but. 
very, very scary. <laughs> I'll admit, um, I had been skydiving already a few times at that point, and I was like, "This is my big push." You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go bungee jumping. And it's so funny because you, you picture if you picture yourself doing something like that, you imagine yourself doing this amazing Superman jump where you just like throw <laughs> your arms out and you jump out into the, you know, yeah. like it's nothing in your head. You're like, "I got this. I can do this." And oh my gosh, when you are standing there, you are like, "This is not what I pictured." <laughs> You know, you're looking down and you're like, oh, geez, I don't know about this. And I think what I did was kind of just like a, just more like a, a walk off the plank kind of thing, <laughs> just yeah. into the sky. <laughs> but um, it was, it was very cool to do that. And and the funny thing was after that, I watched the video and I was like, man, that's not a very impressive jump, you know, and <laughs> it ended up forcing me to do it again. And when I was in Africa, I did it over the um, Victoria Falls, <laughs> the, the oh, waterfall. Wow. And I was like, okay, this time I'm going to go for a big Superman jump and much it came out much better so <laughs> uh that's cool yeah i that's where i did uh bungee jumping the first time was uh i think it was kawaru bungee yeah the kawaru yeah cool that's a beautiful yeah, that's, place to do a bungee hey oh my gosh yeah it, it was uh fall down there when when i was there and so the leaves were all changing it was just it was perfect but yeah the video is not impressive at all <laughs> <laughs> It's funny how you envision yourself in these moments and then you see it in reality and you're like, well, that's not really what happened, but okay. Uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a fun one to, to laugh at, but you know what? I did it. Uh, you know, it's cool to say that you, that, that you did that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where else, books for sure. <laughs> yeah. Where else have you uh, skydived or, or bungee jumped? Um, so my, well, my first ever skydive was in, Actually, and you know what? I think that it's funny that the skydiving that I did the very first time was actually in Pennsylvania. I was 18. And I think that actually was a huge catalyst to my travels in a weird way. I mean, I was just in the States and it was for a friend's birthday. Um, but it was like one of the first times I think I ever pushed, like really pushed my own boundaries. Um, and I think that that was an experience that made me feel confident and feel like, you know, one day I can go out and I can go travel and I can go you know, if I can, if I can skydive, I can do anything, you know, it was, it was the first like confidence boosting moment in my life that I really remember. And that, that made me feel like I could tackle things that were scary and different. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the first one was in Pennsylvania and then the second one was in Switzerland for my 21st birthday. I did a helicopter skydive in the Swiss Alps, which was very, oh, wow. cool. um, that was, that was really neat to be in like a glass top helicopter and, and see the mountains there. Um, and then the third one was, New Zealand in Taupo at Lake Taupo, which is one of my favorite mm -hmm. places in New Zealand. Um, and my fourth one was in Vanuatu or no, okay. not Vanuatu, sorry, New Caledonia, which is a small like French Polynesian Island. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, yeah, that was pretty special as well. Just all different landscapes for all four of those, which was kind of neat, you know, even though that, that period of time that you're actually falling in the sky and then you get to be in the parachute you know, you're looking around, it's probably no more than a couple of minutes, but every single one of those skydives had a completely different set of scenery. So that was, it was kind of interesting to have all those, that variety for that kind of event. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that, uh, changes your perspective on life. Like you said, it was a big confidence boost for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind um, of, it kind of became part of a fun mission as well to like go in different places, you know, I, cause I, yeah. Part of it was like, well, I can go skydiving here. I can go skydiving here. And so it was like, okay, well, now I've been skydiving four times in four different countries, you know? And so that's become like another little milestone. I've started just like, oh, let me let me try and see how many places I can do this in. Yeah. yeah. I wonder how many people have, you know, skydived in multiple different places. I, I guess there's not that many. There's, you know, there's probably not a ton, but for the people that are really into it, so the, the cool thing is, and actually one of my big goals in life actually is to get my skydiving license. Um, which there's different levels of the license, but the A license is one of the, you know, like first level of international licenses in skydiving. And it means that you're certified to dive in different locations around the world. So um, once, once someone works towards getting that license, then they have access to it all over the world. And I think there's, there's got to be a handful of people out there that have that license and that use it. And, you know, I've never met me myself, but I like to think that they're out there somewhere. <laughs> I like to yeah. hope that someday I can meet some others and, and be one of them. But um, for now, I got to pick a location to do the course in. So <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, what do you have to do to, to get a license? So there's a, you usually have to do at least 
oh, there's different courses depending on where you're doing it, but ultimately there's a, there's a number of jump hours that you have to accomplish and a number of courses that you have to complete in order to prove that you have, you know, the ground knowledge, the air handling knowledge, the, um, you know, like there's a course in packing your parachute in, um, the first, the first few jumps involve kind of being assisted by other skydivers that are guiding you through like a radio. So you actually will have like a, a special set of headset in and you'll be listening to their kind of guidance along how to, how to do certain things after you've taken a ground course. And so, um, yeah, basically it's a series of jumps that kind of get significantly more difficult with each one. And, and it's, it's all testing your knowledge and experience in the air. And then eventually you take a test and you, you know, pass the first round, go into the second round. So, um, it, it can be kind of lengthy and kind of expensive, which is why I haven't done it yet. Um, but I know that technically, you know, a lot of times you can do your first solo jump within, I think, three jumps is is when you can do it completely. Oh, really? Independent. Yeah. Wow. If, if you're signed up and, and doing, you know, like working the course, because um, they won't just let anybody just, you know. Yeah do a solo jump on their first go i think it's funny when people are like oh did you do it tandem i'm like well do you know anyone that hasn't done it tandem like you kind of yeah. have to do it tandem the first few times they're not just going to let you jump out of a plane um, <laughs> but yeah it's uh it is something that you can do actually at a bunch of jump centers all around the u.s so i'm hoping now that i'm back to find a jump center and um sign up for the course so yeah that uh kudos to you for doing that that sounds awful to me <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you ever I, wanted to do a skydive or have you done a skydive? I was actually, that's the reason I bungee jumped is I was supposed to uh -huh. skydive uh, in New Zealand and in Queenstown. And uh, like at the very last minute, we, we were out there like ready to, you know, get suited up and everything. And they canceled it because of the weather. Oh, I, oh, like, bummer. I got one day left. I, I don't have time to do this again. So I went bungee jumping instead. There you go. Well, that works. That's a nice close, you know close swap out <laughs> yeah but i was like i just want to do this one time never do it again oh, <laughs> i have no desire to jump out of a plane <laughs> you know it's funny though bungee jumping i find is much harder than skydiving um everyone says that i yeah i don't know bungee jumping seems a lot easier to me here's the thing though well that's but that's good i mean if you've done bungee jumping and if you find it easier then i imagine if you were if you were to go skydiving you'd find that it's like a piece of cake in comparison. The, the big difference is with bungee jumping, like you, you are solo in that moment. Like it is up to you to push yourself off the ledge. And that takes so much guts. And people don't realize sometimes how hard it is to like pull that courage up from inside you and be like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump off this platform. Yeah. Whereas with the skydiving, like you have a, you have a person, like a large human attached to your back. Right. <laughs> and they, they know what they're doing and they're controlling pretty much everything in that first dive. So like, you're just along for the ride, you know, and they're basically going to be the one to push you both out of the plane. And, you know, you don't have to do any work on the way down. You just have to enjoy, the, you know, enjoy the scenery. So in many ways, it takes all the hard work out of it for you. And it just packages it up. And like, you're just, you're just coming along for this amusement park ride. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it was actually funny when I, after I bungee jumped, I was walking up the hill and this lady just would not go. Off. she oh, would not gosh. jump off the platform and was freaking out screaming <laughs> would not do it i kept counting down and finally he was like you gotta go and he was like i'll give you one more chance she was like three two one she didn't jump and so he just straight pushed her off oh gosh oh gosh you know i hear of these things happening i'm like are these guys do they ever get in trouble for that or is that what they're supposed oh, no. to do <laughs> that's crazy but yeah. i bet she came back it was like that was awesome yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, oh, man. I have Funny. been known to convince a fair few people to do bungee jumps and skydives. You know, people that are on the fence, I've been pretty good at persuading them to just go for it. <laughs> okay, well, when you get your license, I'll, I'll go with you. I'll, yeah, I'll there we go. There we go. <laughs> plan. Um, awesome. Well, uh, yeah, so you've been traveling for, you know, six, seven years, uh, pretty much full time. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, seven years full time. And then there was another few years in the middle that I was kind of like in between locations in the US. So I, I realized recently, actually, I was like, well, technically, I've been on and off traveling for 10 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I know you, uh, you mentioned on your website that you're a, a master packer, <laughs> and have lived out of a backpack for a very long time. So tell me a little bit about that. 
Wow. Yeah. Longer than I want to admit, but <laughs> it's kind of funny too, because my bachelor's degree, my first, my undergrad was in um, fashion merchandising. So to think, sometimes I think it's funny that I went from studying fashion and, and retailing to living out of like a backpack with very few options for clothes, shoes, yeah. everything. Else. Um, but I am, I do like to think of myself as a master packer and I find it easier to pack for longer periods of time than shorter periods of time. It's funny, if anyone sees me trying to get ready for like a weekend away, I feel like it's harder for me to pack for that than it is, you know, to go for a year somewhere. Um, <laughs> but I do, I started out with a 55 liter backpack and now I use a 45 liter backpack. Um, Gregory is my favorite brand for backpacks, um, and they sell them at REI and I actually have just like totally loved their products over the years. But anyway, um, they make some backpacks that I really like because they have these amazing front loading pockets that are easy to zip open. So I think the main thing that I always tell people when they're like looking to choose a backpack and you know become an organized backpacker if you're doing like a multi-city thing instead of a or a multi-location thing instead of a hiking or backcountry backpacking trip it's really important to get one of those front loading packs because then you can kind of set it down on the ground like almost like a suitcase and then zip open the top and open it up like it's a duffel bag or something so having that front loading pack but then also being able to access your bag from the top is like super helpful and I've and just using a front loading pack, I think is what has helped me become really organized and, and like a really good packer is <laughs> just being able to have compartments kind of that I, that I use specifically for different things. And I use a lot of packing cubes as well. So yeah, I, I tend to keep things pretty organized within my pack and I know like everything has a place that it lives mm -hmm. and I try and always put everything back in its exact place so that I never lose anything. Um, and yeah, those are the, the simple basics to it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah what so what was that like so you're you're traveling for you know for a very long time you're going through you know you only have so many clothes that you can work with um do you just do you bring uh like laundry detergent and stuff with you or do you find places where you can do that or just not yeah, wash the at all? <laughs> yeah yeah I tend to find places where I can do that I do end up doing a lot of sink washing too sometimes like depending on you know if I'm not doing any like super rig rigorous traveling I'll just wash things in the sink sometimes like one at a time as they get dirty because then you keep up with it pretty pretty easily um, and you can buy these little solutions of like highly concentrated laundry detergent essentially and just put like a few drops in a sink and then just hand wash a few things and then hang them to dry and they can usually you know dry pretty quickly if you're moving on in, in a fast period of time and don't have a lot of time for like a full wash and a full dry. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, I tend to pack with a, like I do a capsule wardrobe kind of thing where I basically have a few set colors that I tend to pack and they're all colors that work well together. Um, and, you know, I don't bring, I don't pack too many patterns. I pack things like bandanas and scarves to kind of like bring in some patterns, but for the most mm -hmm. part, all the things that I pack are things that can be interchangeable and used together. So like all of my tops work well with all of my bottoms and everything can be switched, switched around. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but you know, people don't think about it. And if they pack sometimes things that don't work well together, you end up feeling like nothing in your pack is, is easy to use when things start getting dirty. But if everything kind of works well together, it makes it a little easier. And I do a lot of layering and a lot of, um, you know, like I'll have, a, a puffer vest, but also like a, a lightweight jacket that'll fit over all of that. And then a rain coat that will fit on top of everything. And so if I'm in colder places, you might find me wearing all three of those things. But if I'm in somewhere mm -hmm. cooler, you might find me wearing just like one of the layers. So a lot of layering, capsule wardrobe and washing things as they go. Um, those are always things that have been pretty helpful in terms of like keeping, keeping things organized, but also packing light. Um, I think the shoes are always the harder one. <laughs> it's like trying to decide on what shoes are best to bring. But, you know, that always depends on what kind of adventures you're getting up to. Like if you're doing some serious hiking or if you're just going to be doing light hikes. Um, I tend to bring a lot of trail runners because I think they're good for, you know, they, they work as an all around, like walking around in the day shoe, but also can handle light hikes and things. Yeah, so, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's just Was it happen. hard uh, or, or difficult to... Um, you, you know, to get used to living out of a backpack? Um, I, you know, I don't think it was, it, it, it definitely is like a little transition period. You're trying to find your swing of things and like, 
especially, you know, when you're living in hostels, which I was so much at the beginning, I was, I was in and out of hostels constantly. So you're sharing other spaces with other people. And so trying to find a place to kind of like get used to where do you keep everything in your bag and um, keeping it tidy enough that you don't start losing track of things when you're in a room with multiple people. I think that was, that was like the weirdest transition part of it was that first couple of weeks where I was like, okay, where does this live in my bag and where can I keep my bag when, when I'm out for the day and, you know, I want to make sure that things are organized and tidy so that when I come back, I don't have to do a big, massive repack. Um, and, and what I found was that after the first couple of weeks, when it is a little bit weird and you are figuring out where everything belongs after that first couple of weeks, eventually you, you work your own system and you figure out where exactly everything's going to be and how you want to keep your bag when you're out for the day exploring and then coming back and then needing to hop on a train really quickly. Um, and once you get in a rhythm, then it becomes so easy actually to live out of a backpack because you're like, you, you do know where everything is and you do know, you know, how, how you keep things and what you need frequently and what you don't. And um, it, it does become kind of a bit of a system to just do the same thing in and out of every location, wherever you are, you know, develop patterns for how you find things and keep things clean and tidy. Um, so after a while, it really wasn't too bad. And then it just became the norm. And it was, it, there's something very simple about it. And it's nice, I think, to just feel like you're living in this simple existence where you don't have too many options. You don't, you know, everything's narrowed down for you every single day and you know exactly what you have. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's no thinking about what you're going to wear or, <laughs> you know, you, you don't find yourself tempted to buy things as frequently because you know you have nowhere to put them. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't end up buying souvenirs. You don't end up buying new clothes. You know, you don't need any of that. You realize you're just living with what you have and that's all you have space for. So you, you learn to get by with it. And, and there's something very nice and simple about that, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that that takes some, like, energy uh, or gives you some extra energy because you're not yeah. thinking, thinking or worrying about, oh, what am I going to wear today? You yeah. Only got one option. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because... I, you know, I, I remember seeing some people that would come with these huge backpacks. I'm talking like 85 liter backpacks um, or like huge suitcases. And it, it, that was always interesting to me because, you know, you start out thinking you need so many things. But by the end of their trips, they were like, I'm not even using any of this. Yeah. And I'm just carrying it around every day. And, you know, you start to learn what you really need and what you really don't. And it was funny because then I'd see some of those people again later down the line in different travels. And they might be like, oh, now I now I just travel with a 60 liter or a 50 liter, you know, and, and they ditched the high heels or the hair dryers or whatever else they were bringing. You know, and it's, yeah. it's always interesting to see how people realize what they do and don't need once they're actually on the road. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, you, you learn that. Uh... We don't need a lot of things that we're we're used to in our normal lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, it just it just makes for living a simpler life when you come home too. I think when you you know, especially if you're gone for a long time and you come back, you start to look at your own belongings differently and the things you have and use daily, and you're like, well, what of this do I actually need anymore? You know, and you, it's funny when people start to shift it and prioritize travel in the back of their minds as like, well, if I'm going to be taking a trip at some point, like I probably won't need this anymore, and mm -hmm. yeah start to live with less almost yeah yeah for sure i, I know I, I think too you know traveling to i, I know you talked about being in cambodia and like mm -hmm. i went to guatemala and just seeing how you know how little they live on and how happy they are yeah. it's, it's kind of like wow like i really don't i don't need all these fancy new things and clothes and you know the night the newest gadget and things like that like there's yeah there's a, another way to do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it, especially in those, you know, those travel experiences that really teach you so much more about the world beyond yourself. I think those are some of the most important ones to, to have takeaways from, because, you know, you get used to living, especially if you're living in the States, for example, you know, you, you have access to so much and there's so much around you all the time. And, you know, you think you need these things because you're used to living with them, but until you're put in a different environment and realize how different life can be without all those same things, I think that's when, you know, your perspectives can start to shift in terms of your own life and your own values and, and the things that you think are important. And um, I think that those kind of trips are, can, can do a lot for long-term growth and long-term perspective. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, living simply, there's a lot to be said for it. And I think my time in Cambodia, as it sounds like your time in Guatemala, was one of those experiences where you realize, you know, it, 
you, you really don't need that much to get by and to be happy in life. And, and a lot of times what's most important is the people around you and, you know, the, the environment that you're in here and now and whatever you need to get by and exist in that doesn't always have to involve the technology and the social media and, you know, all the, all the things that, that we fill our lives with day to day. Um, mm -hmm. when we're not exposed to those environments. And I think it's really interesting to see and learn what we can live and live without. Yeah, definitely. And and I think too, I mean, not to go down this rabbit hole too much, but, you know, I think some of the, the happiest countries on the earth, on earth are, are the ones that, you know, are some of the poorest and, Absolutely. and things like that. Um, I know here in the U S you know, we're getting more and more depressed and anxiety all the time, but we have more and more things all the time too. Yeah. Yeah. I could, uh, believe me, I could go down that rabbit hole for days. I think, <laughs> I think that's something that you really notice when you, you take some time away and separate yourself from it. And, and it's no, in my eyes, it's no coincidence that, you know, that that is the way things are here. And, you know, with people becoming more depressed and more anxious, you know, you can't, it's hard to ignore those parallels. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I remember when I was in Cambodia, one of the one of the memories I have from when I first moved there, um, seeing a couple kids running around in the village and they had these empty water bottles that they'd they'd cut in half and they'd turned into like little cars. They had they had sliced the water bottles lengthwise and taken the bottle caps from the water bottles and put made wheels. Oh, nice. the caps. And they had, you know, just popped a little stick through there and put the bottle caps on either end and created these little cars. And then they attached a string to them and tied them to the backs of their bicycles. And they were riding around the village with their bikes, dragging their, you know, little homemade water bottle cars behind them. And they were having the best time. I mean, the best time I've ever seen little kids have in, in that kind of, you know, that, that setting was just in so many ways, it was so foreign to me because you see kids in the States sometimes with, you know, all these toys and all these fun things. But, you know, sometimes it's the simple things that can be really the bring the best joy, you know, like a cardboard box or something. You know, you get it. Yeah. You know, how often can you think of times where kids got gifts for Christmas or birthdays or whatever? And all they wanted to play with was the cardboard box, you know. <laughs> So it's, it's just bringing it back to the basics. And I remember seeing that and just being so happy that these kids were so happy with so little, you know, and knowing that sometimes less is less really is more. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, like, yeah. Um, yeah. That's, it's so fun to see. I think that's, that's part of why I think everyone should travel is, is you just, yeah. you get to see a different perspective of life and a different way of, of doing things. And, Definitely. and like, you know, even if you don't, uh, you know, don't change your lifestyle or something. I think it just helps you shift your perspective a little bit. Agreed. Agreed. I think everyone should travel if they can find the time. And I think one of my favorite, you know, like fun facts about travel sometimes is actually that it doesn't, you know, people think it's expensive. They think you need a lot of money to travel. And I think that that couldn't be farther from the truth sometimes. You know, you really, when I'm traveling full time, I spend less money than I do if I were living full time in the U.S., <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that that's something that like blows people's minds sometimes, but I'm like, well, really when you're moving around constantly, like think about all the money that you put towards your car, your apartment, your, mm -hmm. you know, health insurance, your, all the things that we spend, you know, your, your phone bill, your internet, all those things, streaming services. If you took all of that money and put it towards travel instead, like you don't, you find you don't need streaming services because you're busy seeing things all the time. You don't need yeah. internet full time because you have it wherever you're staying probably. And you know, so much of that money could be filtered to some other, <laughs> you know, some other endeavor. And I think it's, it's fascinating to think that travel doesn't have to be really expensive. You know, if you, if you like to travel a certain way, of course it can be, but you know, you can travel affordably and still experience the world and learn new things and see so much on so much less than you would maybe live on in the States. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there's, there's so many places that are far, you know, far cheaper in yeah. terms of the living. So it's, it's a uh, your your money's going to go a lot further in those places. Definitely, yeah, um, yeah. So that's I mean that's a question I get all the time is how are you able to do all of this? Um, you know, being being a, tw a twenty something, uh, they're <laughs> like, oh, you traveled so much uh, on all of this. And what do you tell people? <laughs> I mean, essentially, what you what you just said is, I mean, it, it depends on how you want to travel. I've, you know, I've done a lot of the the hostel life. Um, you know, I've traveled, 
uh, in very, very cheap ways, you know, not, not spending a lot of money on different things um, and just going out and, and seeing the, the world, um, yeah. you know, you're, you're able to find those opportunities where, you know, maybe the, you're looking at flights and, and one day it drops $200 or there's some sort of discount or whatever. And you, mm-hmm. you jump on the kind of thing. I, I think it takes a little bit of, of planning and research maybe, but um, you totally can, can live on very, very little every day and, and travel the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, what think, would be, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, it just, it's funny. I, I tell people sometimes when I was living in Cambodia, my phone service was $5 a month and it was the best phone service I've ever had. And my apartment was, you know, $250 a month. And it was one of my favorite apartments ever. And it's, you know, when I tell people that sometimes they're like, wow, really? And I'm like, yeah, you know, life. I mean, granted, that's a very affordable, that's one specific destination that is particularly affordable. But in general, it gave, it gave me access to so many other places close by. You know, I could easily get to Vietnam by a bus or Thailand by a quick bus or, you know, fly up to Laos or Malaysia, you know, there were, there were so many places you could access from there. And so being based and sometimes long-term travel, I think is really interesting too. It's like a a cheaper way to travel is by traveling slower as opposed Mm -hmm. to like cramming everything into a week or two weeks. You know, if you take a month, sometimes you can spend even less and see a little more. Um, And so that's always an an interesting twist to the way people tend to view travel. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Like if you're traveling, you know, if you're flying to Europe for a week and then flying back, that's going to be expensive. Right. But if you're flying to Europe and then you take the train for two months, Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a lot cheaper kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, Mm -hmm. just kind of thinking through it. I think, uh, you know, and finding those opportunities and obviously, you know, Europe's going to be more expensive than some other parts of the world too. So finding those nations helps as well. Definitely. (laughs) Um, so then, yeah, you uh, you worked abroad as well. Tell me a little bit about, you know, working working visas and that sort of thing. Yeah, so the working visas were ones that I didn't even know existed until, until I got into traveling and started meeting other people who told me about them, which is ultimately why I ended up starting my business was because I wanted to help other people find out about the visas that I'd learned about along the way. Um, but the, the two best ones that I think are that are totally underrated still are... Um, the Australia and New Zealand working holiday visas, which are for anyone who's got a bachelor's degree, I think in some cases they have extended it recently to an associate's as well. Um, previously, they were you needed a four year degree um, in order to be eligible. But I think now they've actually changed it a little bit because quite honestly, after the pandemic, they just, you know, they didn't for two years, they had no international work coming in. And those mm-hmm. those visa opportunities are actually ones that help fuel their economies quite a bit as well. So they've changed up some of the rules recently and changed the age restrictions and things like that, which is great. But the working holiday visas are pretty unique because you can go for a year to New Zealand, but now Australia lets you extend up to, I think, three years maximum. Oh, wow. Um, and you can do any kind of work, which is awesome. You don't have to have a job before you go. You don't have to be committed to working in any particular industry. You don't have to work in the industry for which you had a degree. Like, you can do any kind of work. And the funny thing is, you get over there, and most people are not even trying to take on serious jobs. They're just trying to have an experience. So yeah. a lot of people are, you know, working hospitality or retail or in tourism. So they're doing fun jobs. They're doing jobs that allow them to like have some flexibility with their schedule and get out a bit more, you know, and and you can also take on jobs in offices or in more serious positions. But for the most part, a lot of people treat it like an an experience in international living. You know, it's it's a chance to be abroad and experience a new place and meet new people and the, the type of jobs you can get are often with other travelers. And so you're exposing yourself to people from around the world. So I really love those working holiday visas. And I think they're such a golden opportunity. And I did um, one in New Zealand and one in Australia. And it, it was just, it's just an amazing experience. And then my, in Cambodia, it was a work visa that I was on and I got that through the company that I was working for. Um, and that was a job that I just found through a friend that I met while I was on a working holiday visa in Australia. So, you know, the, the connections that you start to make once you're on the road, they kind of open new doors for you. And, um, you know, the work visa, I wouldn't say that's always something that's going to be easy for people to get, but the working holiday visas, you know, if you meet the criteria for Australia and New Zealand working holiday visas, you're almost guaranteed to get the visa. And uh, I mean, those are just those are just phenomenal opportunities to to get out and see some 
amazing pieces of the world and, and get to earn a local wage, which makes it easier to get by, you know, because like I said, it can be expensive to travel in Australia and New Zealand, but if you're working in those countries and earning those wages, then it's actually a lot easier and a lot more reasonable to kind of get around and see things. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. With, with those visas, are you allowed to, to leave the country? You are, yes. They're considered multiple entry visas. So a lot of people actually do. They come, sometimes they'll only do the visa for a couple months. Sometimes they'll do it for the full year. But during that time, you're always allowed to leave and come back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a good base for exploring like Southeast Asia and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and just for the for the listeners, what, what would be the difference between a work visa and a working holiday visa? So it's just... The working holiday visa is something that the U that the New Zealand and Australian governments offer to different countries. Um, and so it's just the name for the visa. So it's yeah. the biggest thing about visas is like knowing the type of visa that you need. Um, and a working holiday visa is open pretty much to anyone that meets the criteria. And the criteria is pretty broad. Like I said, you know, having a degree, being able to prove that you're in good health and prove that you have a certain amount of money in your bank account to support yourself. Um, and they, again, allow you to do any kind of work, whereas work visas almost every country offers work visas but the conditions under which you need to get one um, you typically already have to have a job lined up you can't get a work visa usually if you don't have a job um, so in in many of those cases you have to kind of apply for a job first they have to offer you one and the company has to be willing to help sponsor you to get a work visa mm -hmm. which is usually a little bit trickier of a process because unless your job is actually needed, then for the most part, there's a lot of countries that aren't really interested in sponsoring people to come and work because they have local workers that can do the job. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, unless you have like a highly specific skill set or something that they actually need in the country, then it can be tougher to get a working holiday, uh, sorry, a work visa in particular. But it just depends. Every country does it differently. Um, but the working holiday visa is a unique opportunity that's catered just to a certain market. So it's an audience of people between the ages of approximately 18 and 30 35, I would say. So it's a youth visa that it's made to kind of encourage youth to come live and work, whereas a work visa could be all ages. That's just something that you have, to have the specifics to kind of meet the requirements and apply for. Um, yeah. But the working holiday visa is kind of like a very open-ended visa that's just targeting a specific age group. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Is there uh, any places that you're looking at to, to have a work visa in, in the future? You know what? I'm, I, this is, it's weird to say this, but I'm actually pretty much done with my travel, with my like big long term travels now, my big long term okay. moves. Um, I have reached a point where I'm ready to like set down roots somewhere because <laughs> as much as I love living out of a backpack, it's been, yeah, it's been a little over seven years. So I think I'm ready to find a home and, and make it a home. And I'll still, of course, do a lot of traveling. But um, yeah, I'm ready to have a place that I can kind of unpack my bags and feel like I'm setting up roots for myself somewhere. So I think I'm done with my big international moves. It's funny, I was actually offered a job in France three weeks ago. Oh, wow. And it was so weird to be like, I'm going to turn this down <laughs> because I actually am ready to be home. So mm -hmm. no more big moves for me. And I've actually aged out of all, I've aged out of all the visas that I know about um, that that I was eligible for. So all the working, I, you know, I did my two working holiday visas and then the other working holiday visas that I learned about. Um, I'm too old to do them now. So they're, they're out of the, <laughs> out of the question for me, but um, yeah, I decided it's time to be home. Oh, well, very cool. Do you, do you feel like because you've done all of that travel that you feel like satisfied, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, satisfied and like, yeah. okay, that I've, I've moved on to a different stage in life. And yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. And that. yes, I do think I feel satisfied now. I mean, it's, it's so weird because when I was going, I was like, I'll never get tired of this. And I, and I won't, <laughs> I'll never get tired of that kind of moving around. But, but I did reach a point at some point, you know, I wasn't sure, to be honest, I wasn't sure if it was going to come or not, <laughs> that I'd ever find a point where I was ready to kind of stop. And um, yeah, I mean, I reached a point recently where I was like, this has been an incredible adventure and I'm I'm like very proud of myself for having accomplished it because it was something I always wanted to do and I just never knew how and I just you know I did just figure it out and I'm I'm very proud of myself for going out there and doing it and, and learning learning as I went but yeah I mean eventually I reached a point where I was like I think I think I'm tired and I think I want a community in one place and 
you know, a way to do that was to take a break from at least living abroad and constantly moving. I mean, I'm still, like I said, I'm still going to travel a ton. Um, but now it's going to be with a home base, hopefully. Whereas before I didn't actually have a home base. I was just constantly, you know, like when my visa was over, I would go to a new place because I didn't have anywhere else to be. Um, yeah. Whereas now I'm like, okay, I want a place of my own to be a home base and then I'll travel from there. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's my goal right now. But in many ways, like, you know, you're never fully satisfied once you've got the travel bug in you, let's be honest. Yeah. But, but um, I'm satisfied enough to, to call it quits with the constant moving and, and be done with the, the visa to visa thing. I'm ready to like build a community in a new place and set down some roots and, and just, yeah, do, do shorter backpacking trips from here on out, you know, like a couple months at a time and come back. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Geneva, any uh, other travel or working travel uh, tips or stories that you want to share? Honestly, just in the tips department, I really just like I can't encourage people enough to get out there and travel and specifically taking advantage of visas. Like if you still have the opportunity, you know, if you're still within the age limit to do a working holiday visa, for example, and you meet the criteria and if it's something you want to do, don't pass up that opportunity because it'll be gone before you know it. And so many people would say, oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. You know, there's this good thing going on in my life right now. And I just, I just want to ride this out. And I, I get that, but like, these visas, I've seen so many people miss out on them because next thing you know, one good thing leads to another. And then you're kind of like, well, I'm comfortable here. I'm comfortable. And then, you know, once those opportunities are gone, they are not easy to come by again. And I've, you yeah. know, I've learned that myself. And um, there were, th there were three other working holiday visas that I didn't learn about until I was too old to apply for any of them. <laughs> and I'm only, and I'm only like early, you know, early ish thirties. Um, but I've already aged out of all of the opportunities and I only got to do two of like six, you know? So mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing where if you keep waiting, eventually that they won't be options anymore. And so I can't encourage people enough to like, just go out there and do it. And if you don't know how find somebody who can help you, you know, that's, that's why I started my business was to help people learn what their options are and feel comfortable actually going out there and doing it because it can be scary. It can be scary to move to a new place and, you know, get set up with a bank account and a tax number and a new phone number and a new address. But it's once you're doing it, it's not that bad. And, and my goal is to help, you know, make that process easier for people, help them know where they can go and, and how to go about doing it, you know, one step at a time, because otherwise it's, it can be really overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. And it, it can be such an adventure on the other side. So really, I just, I just want to encourage more people to, to take advantage of these things they want to do and, and not just wait until the perfect chance, because the perfect chance never really comes. You just like make <laughs> yeah. it, you know? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're never going to have a perfect time. There's always going to be some reason to not do it. Yeah. Yeah. You got to yeah. pick and choose your battles and, and go for, go for these adventures when you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So why, why should uh, people, you know, go to your website? Should, why should they uh, talk with you about, um, you know, working abroad or, or long-term travel and, and what, what kind of services do you uh, provide? Yeah. So, I mean, I would hope that people find me if they're interested in, you know, working, working abroad and finding out about their visa options. Um, I do focus mostly on travel and work abroad coaching. So, you know, I, sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's just one session so that I can give you the inspiration and the tools you need to go off and, and tackle things on your own. But if you're looking for more guidance, like I, I do have three and four session, you know, three and five session packages where I work with people like more long-term to, to develop an actual plan and feel a little bit more confident going out there and, and moving to a new place. Um, but my main goal is to help like get people abroad for, for these visas and, and help them understand what their options are. And so, you know, if you're just looking, whether you're just looking for inspiration, you know, I've got these free calls that I offer people just to kind of like talk through the options. Um, or if you're looking to take action, then yeah, three, five sessions, whatever we need to make sure that you're like plane ticket in hand and, and en route and ready to go live, live a year or more somewhere. Um, but yeah, just, you know, reach out if you're just like not even sure if you just want to know, like, what is there that's out there? What can I do? You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at just hashing out options with people. So um, my website is hopefully a good way to get some inspiration. And, and there's a few blog posts on there. I haven't touched the blog in a little while, but I'm hoping to get, get back on that shortly. Um, and start putting some more kind of inspiring posts up there about different types of things you can do abroad and, and how to travel affordably and, and how to pack light. So <laughs> um, definitely keep an eye on the website for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, just all the different ways I can help people kind of 
go fun places and do fun stuff. Yeah, awesome. And what is your website? So it's unwrapyourmap.com. And I'm also on social media at Unwrap Your Map. And yeah, I'm I'm happy to connect with people however they want to find me. But Instagram is probably one of the easiest ways. And then I also have a contact me thing through my website. And you can also sign up through calls directly through unwrapyourmap.com as well. Um, and those are those are your best bets to track me down and start learning about travel opportunities. Yeah, yeah, I, I would recommend to all the listeners, if nothing else, at least go check out the Instagram and website because you got amazing pictures on there, very well laid out and everything. It's it's awesome. I've I've enjoyed uh, looking through it the last couple of days. Thanks. It was fun to make it, so I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> uh, well, Geneva, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and and sharing your experiences and knowledge. Um, I really enjoy the conversation, and uh, I, I think you've really inspired me to look more into you know, some of those travel, extended travel opportunities as well. Yeah, well, good. I, I hope so. And yeah, I hope, I hope other people find it helpful as well. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Kyle. This has been fun. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, I, I hope you have a great rest of the day and uh, look forward to seeing you somewhere around the world soon. Sounds great. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Yep, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hey everybody, Kyle here. If you enjoyed today's show and want more, you can always check out every episode on Spotify, Anchor, YouTube, and now Amazon Music as well. Just search for Our Travel Experiences on any of those platforms and it will pop up. You can also find everything all in one place on my website, OurTravelExp.com. And if you want to see my travel pictures as well as travel pictures from guests on the show, You can check them out on Instagram. The page is called Our Travel Experiences Podcast. And if you want to share your own pictures on the Instagram page or be a guest on the podcast, you can message me via that Instagram page or email me at OurTravelExperiences at Outlook.com. I would love to see your pictures and hear about your travel experiences, so please send them my way. And if that isn't enough for you, make sure to check out my weekly YouTube show from Around the World Fridays. Every Friday, I'm taking five to 10 minutes to answer questions from listeners, share some souvenirs that I bought over the years, um, share my postcards over the years that I've accumulated, or share videos and pictures from one particular city or country that I visited, and so much more. So check it out, guys. You won't be disappointed. And uh, make sure you go subscribe to that as well. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you somewhere around the world soon.